So this is a, a very uh, short talk about uh, work in progress. We uh, have started very recently. We do have some very preliminary interesting results. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, the, my main message is actually complementary to what Jure was saying. And perhaps uh, <clears throat> it says that I think Jure's message should be a little more qualified than it, it was. Because what I have heard as the main conclusion was that uh, you know, confinement is a tool to control the epidemic. And I think uh, everybody agrees with that. But what I will show you is that uh, confinement uh, brings its own set of issues uh, that uh, should make us a little more careful when we, uh, uh, when we advocate for it. Um, anyways, uh, this is a piece of work that we do together in a team. Uh, there is uh, Hamed, who's a uh, uh, a PhD student who, of course, is, uh, with most of these projects, does most, most of the most of the work. Uh, Rita uh, Orji is a colleague who works on uh, uh, social media apps that uh, kind of uh, are uh, helpful in modifying people's behavior in terms of health habits. Uh, and the important person on our team is Swarna Wirasinga, who's a, a professor of epidemiology at my university. So. I think what's interesting here is that the work we've done is actually uh, checked for, you know, uh, uh, sanity by an epidemiologist. And she puts questions in front of us that uh, are interesting for them. And she also is able to transmit the results to the health authorities. So it's, uh, we're not a bunch of computer scientists that uh, try to save the world here. All right. So before I go, I usually in these talks, I try to show you where Halifax is. So this is Canada. We are right on the East Coast, on the ocean. Uh, I'm in this university with a weird name of Dalhousie University. And uh, I am actually physically now in Ottawa, where the other arrow is. It's about a thousand kilometers uh, distance. Uh, you see it projected on all of Canada. So we're a little bigger than Slovenia and bigger than the United States, by the way. Um, so, uh, but that's just to uh, give you a context. And we are looking for for postdocs uh, desperately if uh, there's a plug that i may be allowed uh, anybody's interested we uh we are looking for people with machine learning background interested in um, applied projects all right so this is work in progress uh the main message is that confinement especially longer term you know i just talked to friends in italy they are three or four weeks confined that taxes people's emotional states very seriously and will off obviously have impacts on public health in areas other than COVID. And the point is that knowing how the state evolves all this over time, the emotional state of people under prolonged uh, confinement, and they help, uh, and I will give you some examples, uh, help authorities to fine tune their policies territorially and temporarily. So this is uh, what my main message is. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, this is a pilot project, but that project uh, Actually, it's just starting. We will be uh, continuing it, and I'm very excited about it. I'll tell you a little bit about the plans as well. So, first of all, you know, if we want to gauge or measure the mood, how can we do that? And one way to try to do this is with Twitter, right? And there's multiple studies that Twitter was used for uh, evaluating the happiness of a population or things like that. So, we're doing something like this. We say, there is a group of people, there will be maybe a prevailing mood. Uh, a proxy for this mood will be how people indirectly communicate their emotional state on Twitter. Of course, I'm the first to say that this is not uh, an essentially a, a public health uh, a valid result because the population of people on Twitter is a very specific one. But I think if you project that, let's say, some years into the future, where naturally, because of the changing demographics, uh, more and more people will be communicated, uh, communicating in a Twitter-like manner. I think this is something interesting here. So these are my disclaimers. What we did in this pilot, we collected about 1 million tweets uh, <clears throat> with hashtags uh, that had to do with confinement. And uh, we have then, of course, cleaned that. And anybody that's worked with uh, Twitter data knows that uh, it's mostly garbage. So we were left about, uh, with about 10 by 4 um, tweets that we could use. And the way we use them is here. So this is a bit complex uh, uh, overall architecture of the system. But basically, what's important is that we have those three parts. On the left, we have the data. 
So I don't know if you guys can follow my cursor on on this uh, on this communicator, but uh, left yes, bottom, we, we yeah. left bottom, we have tweets coming from different hashtags. All right. Then we do some uh, basic NLP standard pre-processing, you know, sentence splitting, stop words. Of course, we clean the HTML hashtags. We we stem and so on. And then the key thing is that we this this arrow here, these two arrows, that map the tweets into emotions. And of course, we don't pretend to be original here. Uh, we work with a well-established and recognized framework for emotions, particularly in computational linguistics, which is a derivative of Ekman's original pioneering work years ago on emotions. And that's the Plutic theory or taxonomy that basically has eight, and that's why it's so popular, eight uh, emotional states, and you have them here. Trust, surprise, sadness, joy, fear, disgust, anticipation, and anger. So we use the NRC emotion lexicon. It's a Canadian, very well done system for English. I believe there may be even a French version that takes essentially uh, words and maps them into emotions, uh, one of those eight. So this is the fundamental uh, tool that we use. And you'll see that what we do, in fact, is uh, at this point, very simple. We do have plans how to uh, uh, make it more complicated but in any event we have these uh emotions now per a tweet and then uh we have uh, a, an emotion annotated data set right and then uh so this is where plutic emotions come in and then we do some further nlp a uh, lot of it is actually you know planned so for instance we could take uh and we plan to do that we could take the tweets and try to actually add topic. And, you know, I don't know if LDA would be applicable here because LDA, of course, that's uh, probably the most uh, used tool for that, but uh, it's been designed for longer text, basically papers, right? Or at least abstracts. And we are dealing with tweets. So if anybody has suggestions in the discussion of what is the, the right tool to identify topics for Twitter, that'd be great. But anyways, uh, this, this part here, uh, we started on that. It's in the paper that I had a reference to on the first slide. Uh, that paper is just a draft. Uh, I wouldn't even read it. I wouldn't recommend it because we've changed many things, but uh, it is a reference. Uh, and there we, I think, have some PLSA uh, and LSA results for topics, but I, I, I have some doubts about uh, you know, the solidity of those. That's work in progress. And then uh, we essentially go to outputs, and that's the interesting part. Uh, we uh, uh, we take these tweets, we uh, classify each of them with uh, uh, the emotion, and then uh, then what's interesting is that we look at it longitudinally. So we have data for six or eight weeks, let's say in May 2020, when there was a lot of confinement in many countries, and we can see how the mood changes, and that's what makes it interesting. Because then people can see that the prolonged confinement actually makes, and I will show you some of the results, uh, makes kind of the, the emotional state of the people affected uh, uh, much more sensitive. And uh, in here, uh, we, and I will mention that there's potential for machine learning, but we haven't done that in that pilot. Uh, we will do it now. So this is where we are. Let me show you an example that I think will make it all very clear. We have a pure tweet here. That's how a tweet looks, right? So tons of garbage, like most of it is not usable for us, okay? We clean it. We had sad man, friend who lives, skin, cat, stand, company. So this is, of course, after stemming and all this, not very understandable. Then we use the Plutic uh, NRC uh, uh, emotional lexicon, and we map it into, <clears throat> excuse me, scores for these eight emotions. And we see that... Uh, the uh, the fear here is the prevailing uh, 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 emotional state for that tweet. So uh, sad, sadness, I think, sorry, sadness. So we say this is sad. This, that's a very simple way of understanding what we do. Very, very simple, basic uh, tools that we use at that point, but I, I claim they do work. So this is what we do. And then we work longitudinally. So that's what I was referring to. And this, I think, is an interesting graph in itself. On that very limited data set, you see what is by far the dominating feeling. Fear, right? I had somewhere the color scheme here. Yeah, right there. 
this is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, maybe the colors are not all that, uh, but fear is the number one. Then we have joy here, you know, and uh, look how low the trust is, very, very low. So, so this is how people, you know, how they, um, how they kind of, what we can understand from the tweets about the prevailing uh, feeling. And it's, 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 uh, it's fear, and it kind of has an upward trend here in this limited data set. So I think this in itself is an interesting finding to communicate. It's kind of obvious, but it's now evidence-based. And, uh, you know, and of course, uh, with a richer data set that we now have at our disposal, we can make much uh, more interesting findings. Uh, but um, the point of this research is that with these results, especially if we build them to scale, which we are in the process of doing, that people could lower the stress knowing what's coming, right? So they know that if you stay another week, you will probably have that feeling. Maybe you can kind of anticipating this, do something, get involved in some activities that will make it, that will moderate that. Plus, very importantly, this has potential uh, actionability for public health uh, authorities. For instance, if we are able to geographically, which we are now, uh, 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 circumscribe these results. We can say that, for instance, in this metropolitan area, that sort of bagel outside Toronto, where there's five million people living, uh, you know, that's really sensitive for whatever reasons we would know. And uh, people get, you know, frustrated uh, faster than, than elsewhere. So maybe the local health authority can say, instead of the standard confinement, which in Canada now is still 14 days, we can lower it to seven days because we know from the uh, uh, epidemiological data that probability of infecting without symptoms after seven days is almost zero. So this is the kind of thing that becomes doable. And, you know, there is the, here's the data that make, make the public health authorities go this way. So this is where we are. I said this is just a preliminary pilot, but we will now scale that because what happens is now we have support of Twitter as the organization. We have the full tweet data globally for, you know, now and some way back. And this now we can build a, a really a quality data set, uh, a large one. We will uh, collect all the data, put it in a database. That's where we have the 57 fields with retweeting, you know, all times, geolocations. <clears throat> so we can ask what people were, what were the, what was the, uh, uh, the prevailing mood in Slovenia uh, in uh, the second week of March uh, of 2021. And we can uh, most likely answer this question in a month. So, so this is what we will be able to do. We have the global whole data set. Uh, we will now collect that with a richer set of hashtags than we did originally. And we are able to do geolocation, which we weren't, really weren't with the original data. So that's why we can now do, you know, localized, uh, kind of queries on that. Uh, we will put it in a database that's uh, uh, um, uh, that's searchable, of course, uh, on these fields of which we have 57. I think we will narrow that down uh, after a little bit of uh, reflection to something less. Uh, we will work with vocabulary enrichment because what we now have is, you know, sort of standard English, but we want to add, first of all, some basic medical and also the urban dictionary to be uh, kind of, uh, you know, to and have that emotional mapping for these words as well, and not only for the ones that are in the NRC dictionary, which is kind of a, a polite English. And of course, uh, you know, uh, in our group, we always look for machine learning. So, uh, so in, in a way, I think there's very exciting opportunities here, because if we have these Twitter specific fields, we can now build a classifier uh, that will map those into pluchic emotions and sort of a richer set, not just the words, not just, but the properties of the tweet as well, as well and mapping that into pluchic. So that will be much richer than the, uh, the NRC and Twitter specific. And with larger data, longitudinal data sets, we can, with the real big data that we'll now have, we can do, you know, things like LSTMs and so on on, 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 sequ on sequential data. And we will also look seriously at uh, uh, the uh, state-of-the-art time series methods, because what we have is essentially time series. So this is all I had to say. Uh, I will be happy to 
you know, discuss this. Uh, we are, I think, barely scratching the surface, but we now have the, the data and we have a team in place that I think can do very interesting things. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to chat in a discussion.